I'm going to ask Ed to, to continue with giving us a very detailed protocol of how we can use MPOP to lie single cells, label them, and prepare them into scope sets. And while Ed is uh, getting his slides up, I just want to say how much I agree with what Harris had to say about this field still being in the very, very early stages and having tremendous potential to improve upon both the data that we generate and also the analytical tools that we use to compensate for some of the weaknesses of analyzing these very, very lowly abundant samples. So Ed, I'm looking forward to your presentation. <laughs> So my name is Ed Emmett, I'm a postdoc in the Slabov lab, and I'm going to be talking you through, once you've done your designing, you know what you want in your experiment, how do you actually physically go through and process these samples? So fundamentally, what are we trying to achieve here? We want robust quantification of thousands of proteins across hundreds of thousands, hundreds to thousands of single cells. Following the scope two layout that Harrison showed you, we can look at up to eight single cells per injection into the instrument. So what we need to do for a full scope two experiment is we need robust and reproducible quantification across many, many different sets which we can concatenate together to get our single cell data set. Now, if we go back to the scope two plate layout, we have our carrier channel and our reference channel at the top. These, the carrier can either be prepared individually or it can be prepared in bulk. And your reference, you really need to prepare in bulk. And then for your single cell samples, as described, we randomize this layout. And we include control wells, which include no cell, but other, otherwise subject to all the reagent additions and treatment that our single cell wells are exposed to. You're going to keep seeing this diagram throughout this um, conference. And what I'm going to be focusing on in my workshop is this very first part here. So fundamentally, what are we trying to do? It's no different to what you'd be doing in a normal TMT experiment. We have our sample. We need to isolate this. We need to lyse our cells, digest, TMT label, and combine these samples for mass spec analysis. But while in principle what we're trying to do is simple, as you might expect, we do have particular issues that are unique to low abundance or single cell samples. First part is there's not a lot of protein in a single cell sample. You're talking on the order of 50 to 500 picograms total proteome. Something like a HeLa cell might be at the upper end of this. The monocytes we usually play with towards the lower end. So really not a lot. And for most of the scope two protocol, you're working on the individual cells, not combined with the carrier yet. We also have to process a lot of cells to bring these all together to make a single experiment. This means we need to process tens to thousands of samples. And we're only adding our barcodes late in the process. We have to do our lysis and our digestion and our labeling first. So we really need this process to be robust. Now, what can we do to try and address these issues? In terms of low sample abundance, we can help address this by using small sample volumes, by reducing surface losses. What we can also do is use very clean lysis prep. If we don't need to introduce any reagents that are incompatible with the mass spec, then we don't need a cleanup step at the end to remove them, where we'd be losing protein. For the second part, making sure that our analysis is reproducible and robust, we've moved to multi-well plates, and we're trying to introduce as much automation as we can to remove manual sample processing errors. How do we accomplish this in our lab? And I stress this is exactly what we're doing. You do not necessarily have to use all this equipment, but I'm going to be describing exactly how we are processing our samples. You need a means of isolating cells. Every bit of data you're going to see our lab present has been prepared using a cell sorter just like you would find in any flow facility. 
this is not the only means of obtaining your cells. Manual sorting is another option. And there's also new instruments coming out. For example, the cell in one instrument for micro dispensing. Next, we use a 384 well. You could use a 96 well PCR machine. Standard water bath sonicator, lab vortex, and plate spinner. In our lab, we use a liquid dispenser. We find this really helpful. It helps us minimize our variation in sample prep. This particular one, uh, Formulatrix Mantis, it was the most economical way for us to reliably dispense sub-microliter volumes to each of our wells and help minimize our volumes. Standard speed vac and multi-channel pipettes for combining our samples at the end. So step one, what do we need to do? We start with a 384 well plate, and before we get to adding any cells to it, we need to prepare this plate. We don't want to be adding cells to a dry plate. First thing we do is we add a microliter of HPLC grade water to sort our cells into. And in practice, our lab usually supplements this with a simple peptide mixture. We use water's mass prep. All this is is a very simple five peptide mixture, and this helps passivate the plasticware. This is a very simple pause point. You can prepare your plates in bulk and then leave them till you actually want to prepare your cells. Next, you need to isolate your cells. There's less I can actually say about this particular step. This is going to vary according to your particular model, whether you're working with suspension cells, adherent cells, or tissue cells. However, in whichever way you're preparing your cells, you need to have your cells dispersed into a homogeneous single cell suspension. And they should have been washed with ice cold PBS to remove any contaminants. Now, once you've obtained that suspension, we need to distribute this into 384 well plates. And as described, we've tended to use a cell sorter. We're looking at micro dispensing. There was a question. Uh, yeah, before you go on, do you use any protease inhibitors? Um, question was, are we using any protease inhibitors? No, we don't routinely. Um, we, as I'll describe in a moment, we freeze immediately post sorting and then we transfer as rapidly as we can after. Um, we have routinely used a cell sorter. Micro dispensing is another option. Manual isolation we have done, but realistically, it isn't going to work very well if you're dealing with higher cell numbers. As Harrison described, hopefully you've thought through your plate layout. You've thought through randomizing it. This is an example again. We have. In this case, carrier prepared on the plate, highlighted in green. You have cell type 1, cell type 2, and control wells dispersed through the plate. Now, once we've sorted our cells, we lyse the cells through a combined freeze heat cycle. So we transfer these very rapidly to minus 80, where they're frozen. And this is a really useful pause point. We can prepare all the dishes we need on a, single, on a single day and minimize batch effects. And plate prep can fail. While you've hopefully calculated how many cells you need, if you're able to prepare extras, do. You don't have to take them any further in this process. But if you're able to prepare large numbers of plates in bulk, then if something does go wrong, you have spares. And you don't have to try and compensate for batch effects down the line. When we're ready to take a single plate further, and we process these plates one by one at this point, it's removed from the minus 80, and we transfer it to a 384 well PCR machine. And we try and do this as rapidly as we possibly can to minimize any biological changes to our sample or any enzymatic activity. And all we're doing is a 90 degree C heat step for 10 minutes. Once we've done this, we allow the sample to cool, and then we spin it down to collect any uh, condensation from the lid. It's sonicated for five minutes in a water bath sonicator, and then we spin it down to again collect any liquid that is dispersed. Now we've lysed our cells. 
we need to di uh, digest them from protein to peptides. To do this, we prepare a master mix. I'm giving you the final concentration of the reagents. So we add 100 millimolar triethyl ammonium bicarbonate. This is a mass spec compatible pH buffer. We add trypsin at a final concentration of 10 nanogram per microliter. And the actual trypsin you add can be very important. In our lab, we use trypsin gold. If your supply of trypsin is dirty, that is gonna have a major effect on the quality of your data. So if you want to use different supplies of trypsin, then that's something you'll need to test out to look at them. We then also supplement these samples with benzenase, which digests away RNA and DNA. We had 0.2 of this master mix using liquid dispensing robot we've shown, giving us these final concentrations in our samples. Once we've done that, we seal up the plates and we digest for three hours. Um, again, using PCR machine. And at the end of this incubation, we collect everything in the plate. So we've lysed and digested our single cells. Now we need to actually label them so we'll be able to combine them. We use, again, liquid handler. If you're going to use a different model liquid handler, you should just check it is actually compatible with the 100% um, acetonitrile these tags are stored in. We had 0.5 microliters of TMT, and that's a 20 millimolar stock of TMT. That's a quarter of the manufacturer's uh, recommended volume. For those of you who regularly read molecular cellular proteomics, you may be familiar with the recent Zecker paper in there showing that you can actually reduce uh, TMT levels and get good labeling efficiency. And that's certainly what we've found when we've looked at labeling efficiency in our lab. Once we've done this, we cover the plates, mix using a vortex, spin down, and they're left on the bench at room temperature for an hour. We then need to quench unreacted TMT. We use this by adding hydroxylamine. And we add 0.2 microliters of 0.5% hydroxylamine prepared in HPLC grade water. And this is incubated on the bench at room temperature for 30 minutes. And again, cover, mix, and spin down. Now we need to actually combine the samples. And there's a particular way we do this. So each of our single cells needs to be combined into scope sets. And these will contain a carrier, a reference, and eight single cell channels. And the way we do this is, in this case, I'm adding a combined carrier reference channel. And you add that to your first single cell well, and then flush that through the individual wells. You want the carrier to be going into your single cell wells sequentially to help uh, minimize any losses. Once we've done that, we then actually go and flush through all our wells with 50% acetonitrile to just maximize our recovery and collect any residual peptide material we have. Once we've done this, our samples are in about 20 microliters and there's a lot of acetonitrile in there. We need to condense that down. So we transfer our samples to glass uh, auto sampler vial inserts. And the use of glass is something that we really found valuable. We see significantly lower losses compared to use of plastic. We concentrate these to dryness, and if you're going to run them immediately, then you resuspend in 1.2 microliters of formic acid. Potentially, this can be a pause point if you're not going to run these samples immediately. We then need to either store or run these samples. We transfer the glass inserts into auto sampler vials. And these should then be spun down just to make sure that that 1.2 microliter sample is sitting at the bottom of the vial. Spin this down in just a normal 5 mil Eppendorf spinner. And then we can transfer these to either LCMS-MS for running immediately or they can be stored at minus 80 until you're ready to run them. And we do recommend if you're going to store them at minus 80, just don't resuspend them and store them dry, only resuspending just before you're about to do them. And last, get some great data. You'll be hearing more about this in Gray's talk. 
So I'll just summarize what we do in the protocol across two slides. First, we need to prepare the plates in advance. We don't want to sort our cells dry. We add one microliter of HPLC grade water containing simple peptide mixture. We sort our cells into these plates. You can use a sorter or some other method and freeze these at minus 80 until you're ready to proceed. And this can and ideally should be done in a single batch to help minimize any batch effects that your, your cells may experience. Next, we want to rapidly transfer a single plate at a time to the PCR machine so we can heat lyse these cells. We spin down and cool the plate and sonicate just to help complete the lysis. And then we move to digestion, where we add 0.2 microliter of a master mix to each of these wells, giving us a final concentration in each single cell well of 100 millimolar TAB, 10 nanogram per microliter trypsin, and 0.25 units per microliter benzonase. Second part of this summary, we digest at 37 degrees C for three hours. We then add 0.5 microliters of TMT in 100% acetonitrile, and we use 20 millimolar concentration of these reagents and label for one hour. We quench unreacted TMT with 0.5% hydroxylamine and incubate that for 30 minutes. And we then combine our samples, and we do this in a particular way, taking our carrier material and flushing that through the single cell wells, respectively, minimizing any losses they experience during the sample handling. We dry the sample down to remove any acetonitrile and concentrate it. And then we transfer our combined samples to autosampler vials, which we can then either freeze until we're ready to use or submit for LCMS analysis. Now, I've described this protocol exactly how we're doing it. How can you modify it if you maybe don't quite have the same kit that we have? The easiest thing to do is scale up some of your sample preparation. And this is useful anyhow for preparing the master mix. If you don't have access to a 384 well PCR machine, 96 well plates do work, though you will want to scale up a little bit. And if you don't have access to a suitable liquid dispenser, then you can do this all with multi-channel pipettes. The trade-offs with this are that higher volumes or less automation will result in higher sample losses or more noise. However, it is a perfectly valid approach, and we have had good data using this. It may sound funny from our lab, but not every experiment has to be a single cell experiment. There is perfectly good biology you can do with non-single cell uh, methods. If you simply have low abundance samples, then you can prepare effectively a, a, a scaled up scope set if you're in the 50 cells per channel region. And this is precisely what we describe for preparing our 1x master sets. If you're doing a slightly higher level uh, of experiment with more cells, you can potentially omit the carrier channel. Though depending on how many samples you want to look at, you may still want to keep a consistent reference. If you're using this for 1,000 cell samples, you no longer need the uh, carrier, and you could potentially perform some basic fractionation, for example, stage dip fractionation, to maximize your identifications. At larger cell numbers, you may want to add the benzonase a little earlier in the process and sonicate your samples for a bit longer, just to help make sure you don't have issues from DNA uh, sitting in the sample. So the references for this, we do describe this method in our new Scope 2 preprint. We do have a short link here, bit.ly slash scope2. And this does build on the data from the original Scope 2 manuscript, um, which you can find at this link here. So thank you. I hope that's been helpful. And I'll happily take questions. Questions for Ed? Yes, Nathan. So is, um, 
How would you know if, let's say, one of the wells ended up with two cells and not one cell? So two cells would be harder for us to tell than no cell. Um, you do also get, obviously, large variation in size. If a cell's about to divide, that may be very similar. Um, Currently, using flow cytometer, we are very stringent in our cutoffs, which is the main way we have to distinguish that. We are now using this cell M1 micro dispense instrument. And what's nice about that is you actually get a little photograph of the capillary showing you where your cell was and then where it wasn't. So you can actually see the evidence that there was just one cell there. And um, uh, much like modern uh, cell sorters allow, you can also get fluorescent or uh, size measurements from those individual cells. Again, great talk. Thank you so very much. A um, couple questions. Uh, the one volume I didn't see was, what's the volume coming yeah. off of your, bless you, uh, your cell sorter? Um, it's, we expect, I think it's 30 nanoliters. Three nanoliters. Yeah, we, we don't believe it's significant. Okay, so that's very low. So yep. have you thought about 1536? Do you think there would be benefit to go into 1536, lowering your adsorptive loss even further? Um, the smaller, the better. Um, currently, our choice of one microliter for that first volume is we are fairly confident in a 384 well plate using our cell sorter. We can get the cell to land in that volume. Um, 1500 well plate, I think it'd be great. We don't trust our sorter that much. It is something that we're going to play with with the cell in one instrument, though, uh, where we're more confident about being able to use those smaller volumes. Fantastic. And one last question uh, it's alternative labels. Um, have you done any work with eye track labels looking towards a future where, say, you're looking to put this on a non-thermo instrument, such as the Timstoff Pro that Brian is pushing in the back of the room. Um, at with, I mean, with uh, good reason. It's a wonderful, wonderful instrument. Um, or say, I see that Thermo Scientific is up there. Have you asked them to play with their new 16plex? Um, we haven't had any of them yet. We would love to get some of their new higher throughput um, labels. Um, Certainly, the Timstoff instrument should work very happily with Sixplex TMT. Um, we don't expect an issue there. Um, we have not tried iTrack. We have only tried uh, TMT in our lab so far, though. Um, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, do you have any experience in this uh, fixed tissues uh, for the sample pr uh, preparation? Fixed tissues? So, um, we have only tried this with sorted live cells so far. We have not tried this on fixed cells. Um, personally, I think it should work, um, but that is not something that we have really tried. At what points we can uh, like, uh, introduce the steps to improve the uh, release of proteins when the proteins is fixed with paraformaldehyde and all those? So at what points? we can improve the uh, release of the proteins from the tissues? Um, really, I Especially think... Especially when you are not using DTT or uh, any denaturation agents in your protocol. So, so we think our, our method actually... We think we're releasing quite well, but we do just get losses because we're working in large volumes. So we are going to lose less abundant proteins. So any reduction we can do in volumes is the obvious step to improve this, and that alone. Usually when you add trips into your sample, you're working off a ratio trips in to um, protein. Even for ours with these scaled down preparations, trypsin is in huge excess compared to what it actually needs to be considering the amount in our sample. So the more we can reduce, the better. This might be a naive question, but it seemed like there was no real protein extraction from the samples, and you just digested the RNA and the DNA, um, and so all the rest of the cell contents are still in your samples. Um, do you worry about 
contamination or dilution of your samples with all this other stuff that's not proteins? So, um, as you say, we're not, we're not doing, there is still, for example, membranes in those samples. There's digested nucleic acids, um, which you might think could cause problems with the chromatography. We're running a direct inject setup. We're not using a trap in our system. And our chromatography has been remarkably robust. We don't really get, for example, clogging issues that you might expect. Um, our, we're only really running single cell samples on our system. And the input remains sufficiently low that we haven't had major problems. Um, have you tried using magnetic trypsin like, um, to solve the problem of this excessive trypsin signals? We, we've had some experience um, with trying B-based or magnetic trypsin. We have not had good results ah. um, so far. We've, I mean, we've tried a couple of suppliers, but not exhaustively. Mm -hmm. um, I also, I have another question. Do you think um, sorting uh, stresses the cells and, I don't know, changes proteome somehow? Absolutely. Um, it's, it's documented. Um, unfortunately, we need to isolate cells somehow. Um, this was the most accessible method for us. Um, but certainly, if there are less stressful methods, then there's definite advantages there. Hi, um, so how do you calibrate the mass spec for system suitability so that, you know, that every time you run your mass spec after however many runs, you know, they're coming back with a low percentage variation? Uh, you will be getting this in a lot of detail off gray in the next um, talk. Um, I will mention that what we describe as our master set is also, it's our QC standard because single cell samples are realistically what we are running day in day out on our system it's the most representative sample for us so we do do longitudinal um, checks using that and using the DoMS software uh, thank you I have two questions the first one is uh, is benzones is a, a must have or we, c we could simply ignore it or use uh, or did you use uh, lysine uh, or lysitrypsin mix in your digestion pro process? Um, did you test it? We've used lysitrypsin in the lab. I'm not sure if we've ever used it for scope. Um, we don't routinely use, I don't believe we've ever used lysine for scope samples. However, we have also used lysine or trypsin for, um, if we go, um, some of these low abundance but non-single cell samples, and it does work for us there. You so will produce lice and less miscleavage. Um, potentially, though, we're not seeing high miscleavage rates in our samples. Mm, and for the benzones, is, is it a must-have in the experiment? Benzones to yeah. cl cleave the nucleic acid. Yeah. Is it a must have in the uh, protocol? Is it a must have? Um, we've done it with and without. It's one of the steps where we think it is in general helpful. Um, it may be that if you don't do it, you just see a more regular fail, uh, failure rate on the column. Um, it is not an absolute must-have, though. And you could certainly supplement it with other equivalent enzymes if you wanted. Okay. Um, the sonication, depending on the power of it, should manage to shear some of the DNA. Mm -hmm. um, maybe less so for a water bath sonicator, though. Mm, and the second question is for the constriction of mass, press, mass prep or other peptides. Yep. Uh, yeah, uh, I didn't get the exact n exact amount of peptide into each tube. Is it 25 picomol? Uh, it's, we're adding, in that one microliter, it's 25 femtomol. Oh, okay. Thank you. Hi. I had a nice talk. 
Uh, a question about nuclear proteins. Uh, had you, have you had di difficulty looking at them in this lysis step? Uh, with what proteins? Sorry? Nuclear proteins. Um, we, see, we see good release of, for example, nuclear or other proteins. The details on that, I have not given you the reference, but it is this MPOP reference um, from Harrison, which was on BioArchive from late last year. And there are figures which do describe that in detail. We don't see a problem releasing from membrane compartments. Cool, thank you. Uh, two quick questions. One is, uh, do you see difference that the protocol works uh, better or not in certain cell types than the other, for example, uh, epithelial cells, immune cells, neurons, things like that? Um, we simply haven't tried that many different cell types. Um, for most of the work in our lab so far, we've been working to a large extent on method improvement, and we have some very simple to play with cell lines in our lab. Um, we have played with suspension and adherent cells, but we haven't really tried adapting this to other cell types, neuronal or primary tissue in our lab. Okay. Um, though I think you will hear off Bogdan, who is uh, waving at me. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, second question. Uh, so the membrane bound proteins are readily detected, like uh, receptors and ion channels and those type of proteins? Basically, we, from all the data we have, it looks like if it's exposed on the surface, you, you sh and there's appropriate cleavage sites, you should be able to see it. Um, we don't believe there's a major problem with detecting membrane proteins with the protocol. And again, the data that we have so far on that is in the MPOT manuscript describing it. Yeah, I basically would like to comment on the previous two questions. Y yes, the different cell types actually cause quite a bit of problems. For example, microglia, it's very hard. Uh, and uh, in general, tissue samples are actually, you know, harder to do than the normal just cells that can grow on the plate. And uh, to the previous point, how to create a reference uh, channel for the tissue sample is actually much easier because you just take a chunk of tissue, which is one micro micrometer and just blast everything which is there and it will be your perfect reference channel because it contains everything that it's in the same uh, piece of tissue that you try to analyze. So yes, the difference part of the uh, tissue preparation is extra challenge and then cell size is an extra challenge to any preparation. Very nice talk. Uh, I was just curious about the uh, evaporation rate on your samples. So I assume like uh, you got like a variation uh, definitely there. Um, so this is one of the reasons for using that one microliter um, minimum volume at the start. It's also why we find it very helpful to use a liquid handler and why we do recommend that you do start increasing these volumes if you want to do more manual processing, which can take more time. Um, Certainly, if you took too long processing these, that would be a factor. Um, and also, evaporation in small volumes. These volumes work well in the 384 well plates, but you would want to scale up a bit in 96 well plates just because they have a larger volume inside. Do you think it's possible to do like multi-omics based on scope mass? Like um, genomics and DNA, RNAs and we, we certainly believe it should be possible. Um, it's not working yet. So. When you look at your final analysis, do you end up seeing anything that was from the mass prep, the bradykinin, et cetera, or typically no? Um, we, we have tried looking at them. Um, the mass prep peptides are actually really quite small, so some of them we wouldn't expect to see. Yeah, they don't fly that well. Yeah. Um, of the ones that are bigger, I think, yeah, you see one, um, but it doesn't cause us a major problem. 
is there a possible benefit going back to a question from the first talk of using say IRT peptides so this way you're using things that are not occurring in nature they could both passivate and you could do it a little bit higher and therefore you could also use them as a metric of um, monitoring etc um, certainly so one aspect is potentially using them to try and monitor different stages of failure. Um, we could, for example, introduce different peptides at a later stage to try and see, uh, assess labeling or different parts of this process. Um, we have not optimized this extensively um, with the which peptides we use. Mass prep was in the lab and it was working for us. But you could get other peptides. And we certainly don't believe switching to, for example, IRT peptides would cause any obvious problems. Wonderful.